Welcome into this Five Clubs conversation. I'm Gary Williams. You know, every chance I have to do an interview or a conversation with somebody in and around the game of golf, I look forward to it. But some of these, let's be honest, are pretty frivolous. We're talking about golf. Well, today, we're going to talk about more than golf because I think it's important walking the journey that I'm on uh, to have conversations about real life stuff. And the person who's going to join me has been an inspiration to me. The first time I saw her after I got sober, I told her just that. That person is Brittany Horschel. She's been sober for over seven years. She's obviously the wife of Billy Horschel, longtime, very successful tour player. And she's been very public and very open about her own journey, her own road to recovery. I'm looking forward to this conversation with somebody who, as I said, has been an inspiration to me. That's now. It's only my sole connection to this. It's only in my hands on every single shot. It's an extra two yards of carry when it matters most. Yeah, only a grip. Mine are only golf pride. Respect the grip. And with that, we welcome in Brittany Horschel. Great to see you. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, listen, thank you for doing this. Um, I know you were you were actually on, I heard you with Chantel McCabe on the PGA Tour Radio last week. That was not the impetus for me reaching out to you. I, I've been thinking about this for a while. Um, and I'm, I'm reminded when you have your when you have your anniversary slash birthday slash sober date, I, I do think about you. And there's a lot that I want to talk to you about, but I, I want to start with this because I said it in the open that, that you've been an inspiration to me. Um, and, and one, because you're, you're leading a life of recovery, uh, but also you're willing to do it in a public way, not out there every single day, but, but the willingness to talk about it. And I go back, starting with the Good Morning America uh, interview that you guys did some years ago, how hard was that? I mean, if you can just kind of, your memory bank is, I'm sure, very, very good. Um, just the, the lead in to that, um, trepidation, anxiety, nervousness about doing that, talking publicly? Yeah, I mean, my memory bank is significantly better than it used to be. <laughs> so is <was> mine. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was, so going into the Good Morning America interview, it, it's, it's almost still kind of a blur, but I was extremely nervous. That's not my comfort zone. That's not what I was used to. And also talking about something so raw, um, something that was still, I was, was at a one year sober at that point. So something that was very still new to me. Um, but it also was, um, I felt comfortable at the same time, just because it was something that I knew that I wanted to do. Um, because of how much I didn't understand alcoholism, alcohol intake, the effects it has on your mind and body and how I felt so lost, just getting it out there to anybody who felt the same way watching me on Good Morning America, because there were so many years that I watched movies, TV shows, interviews with people thinking like, man, I want that, or I want to do that, or that's how I want my life to be. And at that point, even at just one year sober, I felt like I was there. I was like, wow, I'm living all those moments that I was like, I wish I could do that. I wish I could be that person. I wish I could get up in the morning in New York City and go do a you know, do an interview on TV because I could have never done that when I was drinking ever. There's no chance. The, um, you know, one of the things that I appreciate you doing is that you share your thoughts. Uh, you have a blog, the, the Sober Modern Mom, and I was reading 
your thoughts that you put down um, at your seven year mark, going back to the month of May. And there's a lot in there. And, and so much so that I could devote an hour to just talking about thoughts, phrases, emotions, feelings that, that you had and you shared during that. But one of the things you talk about is the normal people. And, and one of the things that I found is that I, f I thought I was unique, like, and, and you know this, like there are a lot of people who seek help, who think that you know, nobody else thinks like I do. But the reality is, is that there are a lot of people who do. It's the normal people who don't. Has it gotten easier or, or less clumsy or even less humorous to try to explain alcoholism and, and the mind of the alcoholic to someone who can't think that way? Yeah, one thing I, I say a lot is if you're at a restaurant and you're drinking and if you can, you have a half full, you know, alcoholic beverage and you can get up and leave and leave that beverage <laughs> still there, you don't have a problem. I could never fathom that. That is something like, no, like I would have to finish it. There's no, there's no option. And that seems to click with a lot of people who do not, do not have a problem with alcohol. They're like, oh, okay, well, yeah. And just like, there's no way of, of stopping our, our brain. Our brain is just saying like, once we get that, once we get that hit, it's just like, go, 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 go. We got it. That's, and it is hard. It is. If you don't have a problem, it is so hard to understand that. Cause everybody's like, you just stop and no. And then at that point, when you are drinking that much as well, your brain already has morphed and deteriorated and it's not healthy enough to even make healthy decisions to stop on your own, which is why getting help is so crucial. And also why asking for help for a lot of people is hard because they don't even know how to, they don't know where to go. Um, it, it's, yeah. it's, it, you know, I, I, I take some golf trips with some buddies um, and it's, it's so enjoyable to do it now uh, for, for countless reasons. One, that the engagement that I have, that the desire for me to, to be around these guys as opposed to avoiding them, except for when it was altogether necessary, I wasn't making efforts to be with people. But, but similarly to, to yeah, again, like I'll look at my wife who's drinking a glass of wine and, and I'll be like, okay, God, first of all, this is taking a long time. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but, but the other thing is being around these buddies of mine and I'm thinking to myself, like we're on this three day trip. You're not taking full advantage of this but they are, they are. It's not that their days are not built around all the things that you and I used to think that were the most essential things is yep. how much can I intake? Um, and, and every waking moment essentially is what it, what it came down to. And the simplest way I can describe it to people who don't think the way that you and I do is one is too many and a hundred's not enough. Right. That's and people will go with well, that doesn't make any sense. I can promise you to the alcoholic. It makes complete sense, doesn't it? And all you're thinking about every day is when is your next drink? Where can I get my like schedule it in? OK, well, I go here. So I drink here and so on and so forth. And in my case, I was hiding, hiding alcohol yes. through my house. I was hiding alcohol in travel bags. I was hiding alcohol in my purse, you know, anywhere I could, just so I knew I had that comfort that I knew it was with me all the time. Otherwise, it was panic mode of where panic. I could find it. Panic. It's, yeah. it's, you know, I, and again, these unusual things, and for people who don't think this way, I always say, thank God, first of all. <laughs> um, but, but there are people, Brittany, and again, I think part of this is, is your motivation as well. You know, being an alcoholic and the things that are then required of you going forward, there are a lot of paradoxes in, in alcoholism, including the idea that you got to give it away in order to keep it. And what that means is you have to pay it forward. You have to you have to share whether it's in an intimate private setting or doing it more publicly like we're in a position to do that. And I do have to remind myself, like, what are your motives? What are your intentions? Are you doing this for the right reasons? Do you have to remind yourself of that? I've never thought of that, actually. Um, I, I, I guess well, that's there good. is a part. 
There is a part of it that it, I tell people it helps my sobriety, sharing, talking, um, being vocal about it, and then hearing stories of other people's um, struggles or how I've helped them. Um, but I have, I've never, there's, there's no part of me that wants to do this for Instagram followers right. or anything like that. It is purely like, I, like I tell Billy, I was like, I just, I take it one person at a time. Cause I want, you know, I w would love to help everybody as you know, that's impossible. Um, but I, I think that just even on, even on social media, sharing messages back and forth and giving somebody a direction of, Hey, try this first with your wife or your husband and see if that helps. Um, that's why I'm doing it. The, um, the, the hiding, um, the deceit, mm -hmm. which I was riddled with, I was overcome by it. Um, you know, my days, I was on the run. I was on the run physically, I felt like. I was on the run psychologically. I was trying to stay one step ahead of the sheriff, whether that was my <laughs> wife, who I had reduced to being a truant officer slash cop, um, to, to my employer, to my friends. Everything felt like an inquisition. Um, my, my days were so exhausting. And the, the most telling thing my wife said to me it, it, after years of this, truly, she said, you've made lying so easy. Mm -hmm. And when she said that the first time, Brittany, it was, first of all, that's a very hard thing to volley back. Like there's not much response that can be given to something like that. But when I was finally willing to give up and get help, I said, it wasn't easy. It was exhausting. Mm -hmm. It was exhausting. Absolutely. How much Thanks. relief did you feel when you finally said, I give, I give, I, oh. I, I, I need help? Oh yeah. Well, it started with Billy got our friends and family together for an intervention. After one person spoke, I'm like, heck yes, I'm in, I need help. And then every day forward, I still feel that relief of just, <laughs> Like, oh, it's not me. It's not like it, it wasn't me. Isn't that I'm amazing? Not like, I'm not yeah, guilty. I, I'm not guilty. Yeah. <laughs> Phew. I, I still I still feel that every day. It's just I mean, and that I mean, that, too, is like in a, how I correlate gratitude like that. Like, I think of that and I just like, oh, I'm so that is gratitude right there that I just don't feel so so nervous and I'm going to get caught. Who's going to catch me? Oh, he thinks I know. Oh, they know. Oh, do they smell it on me? Oh, I'm okay. And no, I wasn't doing anything. Just all, like you said, on the defense all the time. I, um, I, I want to read some of your words to you. Um, and I, I want people to understand that when, when I read this for the first time, like so many things I either read or hear from fellow alcoholics, there's an identification, there's a relatability to it. You wrote, the alcohol ate away at my body and soul, crushed my confidence, and told me lies. So I, I want to start with, with the body and soul part. Um, the soul, how, how it was affecting you, how it was taking you to dark places, I'm sure psychologically and, and spiritually yeah. and emotionally. How did that feel? I, I mean, I... I felt like I had very little worth that I, I mean, I was convinced, you know, at the time that Billy didn't love me, that why would my friends like me? Um, I had the alcohol had spiraled me into a severe, severe depression. Um, I am not a depressed person without alcohol. You know, I've, it's, I've gone through all the tests, all the therapy, all the stuff without the alcohol in my system, my brain, my body is, is healthy. Um, and so I, I was so, I can't, you know, you think about the dark days and I put on a smiley face, a giggly laugh. I was, you know, most people did not know that there was like, why would I be unhappy? You know, my husband, won the FedEx cup and the tour championship. And, you know, we've got all the money in the world, the, all the beautiful things. And inside I was dead. I did not enjoy anything. I mean, I had my daughter who I loved to death, but even had my daughter, I was still drinking all day. Um, and 
I had no, I had no coping skills. I had no way to build myself up. I had no way of when things got hard to, you know, go do anything, go out for a walk, go exercise, um, tell myself that, you know, I tell myself every day I wear a bracelet that says badass to remind myself, like, you are a badass just for getting up and drinking your coffee and moving on with your day like good good for you um and i never did that when i was drinking i didn't do that probably for 10 15 years after i stopped golfing and graduated from college i had no self-worth and the alcohol fueled that um into a severe depression that took me years to get out of i mean it wasn't just getting sober and um going to treatment for two months it it has taken years and I still, I mean, I probably in five years from now, I'll be like, wow, I still wasn't, wasn't there then. Um, but I feel a heck of a lot better. Yeah. It's, you know, people who, again, some people who are close, like the people who are closest to you, there's, they're, they're confounded, they're angry, they're frustrated, they're sad, they're scared. Um, but we are, we're, we're treating depression which is growing because the, the walls are closing in and you're, you're, like you said, there's shame, there's an absence of self-worth. It's, it really is insanity because you're treating depression with a depressant. Not only was I doing that, Brittany, I was, you know, I was, because I found exercise as a form of isolation, which is another, you know, fundamental aspect of, of the, the, the behavior of the alcoholic. So I would, t- I would tell my wife, I'm going to go swim for a couple of miles. And I would. And then I would, I would literally imbibe a bottle of wine. So I'm, I'm not only am I treating my depression with a depressant, I am, I am putting a diuretic in my body after yeah. exercising. So, I am, so physically, I am running myself completely into the ground the other thing you talked about was crushed. It crushed my confidence. Now, this is, this was like central to what was happening to me. How did it manifest itself with you? How was your confidence waning? How did it show itself? I mean, yeah, it was non-existent. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't do anything. I mean, sure. If you ever talked to Billy about that time, he'd always try to get me to do stuff. Like, why don't you? go on this trip or come with me and do this, start going and, you know, with a trainer, why don't you go hit golf balls? I mean, I, I did nothing because I felt like I could do nothing. I, that nobody would want to hang out with me, that nobody would want to hear what I have to say. Um, And it sounds ridiculous. Like me talking about it now, I'm like, gosh, that is, absolutely absurd but that's how i felt i didn't want to do anything i except lay in bed and you know i took care of my daughter but it was just you know bare minimum and um it's so it's so sad for me to think back on um, it, and but it is it was and bare minimum there, yeah and i know there's so many people that live their days like that but like you know that we see at the grocery store that we we see walking down the street and it's just then they feel like that they have no, they just have nothing to offer. Like it was, bleh. that's not true. It, 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 no, it's, it's, it's absolutely not true. I, and I, I want you to share whether this was true for you, for me, like I, I had reasonably and still do decent willpower. Like if I put my mind to certain things, uh, and I'm determined to do certain things, whether it's a task, whether it's a goal, whatever it may be, I'm, I've always been effective at that, going all the way back to when I was, you know, a kid. If I wanted to do something, damn it, I, I could do it. I couldn't stop drinking. And I was reading books. I was listening to alternative forms of, of how to get help that didn't include total abstinence, which is, again, like I'm thinking, like, like really? Like, never again? Like, th- that's too much. Right. That's too that's too profound. I can't do that. So let me find other ways. But the bottom line is I would, I would give it up for Lent and it's like, was 40 days. (laughs) Boy, Easter was a hell of a party. Yeah, that that was Like I knew where the finish line was so I could do that stuff. It was never, ever 
which seemed overwhelming to me. So my point is, I couldn't stop. And, and it was crushing my confidence because in, in my life, I've always been able to put my mind to do something and I could do it. My work was being affected. Even something that I was good at, like you said, you didn't want to do anything. I used to love when the light would go on and the show would start and hated when it went off. My life, Brittany, was reduced to dreading the light going on and begging for it to go off because it, me it meant that my drinking could resume. I've been reduced yeah. to two hours of live television and that being the most paralyzing part of my day and, and making that admission, I'm not embarrassed by it. I don't feel shame about it. It's just the damn truth. That's yeah. what the disease had done to me. And that's essentially what you're saying it had done to you. Yeah, I tried to quit so many times. Billy put together so many game plans, so many things of like, okay, you can just have a glass of wine when we go out to dinner. Or, you know, you know. Then to the to the end, where it's like, I'm gonna divorce you if you don't stop. Which he's like, I never was gonna do, but he was at his wits' end, and nothing, nothing, nothing worked. It was years of you know, trying and doing all the online quizzes of like, are you an alcoholic, yes. you know, <laughs> trying to figure it out. And yeah, but nothing. It was the same way for me. Um, but I, I, you know, I was, I was functioning to a point. Um, functioning, but, but not I, contributing, not contributing to your no, own advancement like said, as a living. person, yeah. not living. Was, no, you're no. doing what you needed to do for a young child uh, at yeah. the time with respect to Billy and you've written about this, like the damage done. And I know yeah. this, I know my mother, before I went to treatment, who is the most selfless, most compassionate person in, in, in this disease has been pervasive on her side of the family, um, said to me, you have to understand, Gary, you've stood in the middle of your family and you pulled the pin on a hand grenade. And I'm like, holy shit, like, okay, wow, that's my mother just telling me the, the flat, cold truth about the damage I've inflicted on other people. Um, how long did it take for you to be aware of the collateral effects on other people? I mean, I during treatment, they, where I went down at, um, down in Delray, they, they, they treated the whole family. So Billy came down for yep. treatment. His parents came down for treatment. Um, my parents came down. Um, and I think during that time was when I really, it really clicked of how much everybody knew that I thought that like they didn't know in the first place and how sad they were for me. No one was mad at me. No one thought I was a loser, but they were sad for me and they wanted to do whatever they could. They all laid down their lives when I went to treatment and Billy stopped golfing. His dad took care of my daughter, you know, with his mom and my mom. I mean, everybody. And I mean, that's when I, I really kind of was like, all right, this, everybody's been tiptoeing around me, scared to say anything. Um, and I, I think my appreciation for them grew, but I also, I also knew I, I hurt everybody a lot. The, um, going back to, to the infancy of whether it be in treatment or when the immediacy of getting home, when you're in treatment, your days are full. They're full of self-examination. <laughs> it's such a, again, this is another one of those paradoxes about the disease. If you're lucky enough and you're willing to get the help that, that we all need is, as selfish as I've been, guess what? Now I'm gonna be more selfish than I've ever right. been because whether it's 30 days, 60 days, what, however long it is, I'm gonna dig in on myself and I'm gonna think only about myself in terms of like, how did I, how did I get here? Um, you were, you were, you've been very transparent. You, you shared a note card going back a couple of years ago of things you wrote about yourself, about, about being a liar. Uh, about your own selfishness. Was that an easy exercise to do that or was it hard? No, it was so hard. I have to say getting sober and doing treatment and those days, uh, I mean, I did it to myself is what I, I mean, I did it to myself, but, but building yourself 
climbing out of that hole that you have dug yourself is it's grueling. And I, I, I understand why so many people fail and stumble and stumble and have to start over again. Um, I mean, there were days when I was in treatment that all I could think about was like, my head will hit the pillow at night. Like I, I will, I will get through this day. It will end. Um, because you are, you are talking about the worst parts of yourself every single day. And you are admitting to, of all your failures and you are admitting all your worst fears um, and putting them all out on the table. And you are the one, you put them out there, but you're the one that has to fix them too. No, no therapist can fix them for you. They can help you. They can, you know, lay the pathway and say, this, this is where you need to go. And this is what you need to do. But, um, you know, I was the only person who could little by little start putting my life back together and start gaining the trust back of Billy and all my family members. Um, and I'm sure as, as you know, that yes. is a uphill battle in itself and there's nothing you can do. Time is the only thing that helps you in that aspect. Um, I mean, I had a sober length that I blew into twice a day that, Me too. that was one of the agreements that Billy and I did. And I did that for a long time. <laughs> um, but that, you know, that was one of the things that Billy was like, I, you know, if, if you don't want me on you 24 seven, you need to do this. And, and to his credit, he left me alone and he knew I was doing the sober link and that was it. <laughs> you know, um, again, for people who are going, God, really? Yeah, really. I mean, it is what, what, yeah. when, when, when people are, are deceived, lied to, um, manipulated for years at a time by somebody who is being overcome by this disease, the, 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 the PTSD, the, the damage psychologically done to them, there is a, you know, there is a requirement of time and it takes a long time to rebuild trust to, to find yourself to where there is, like you're talking about, look, and I, I, I find myself, just as an aside, like I, recently I was walking through the mall and I had this, this feeling like, like, wow, you're not guilty of anything right now. Like, God, what, a, what, a, what an amazing feeling. Like, because I can promise you, I used to walk around places and go, okay, I could probably run into that restaurant, drink, drink two drinks before rejoining my family easily. Anyway, the, the point is, oh, yeah. is that, that the damage done to you, the person who's overcome by the disease, is one thing. And it's a lifetime of repair and recovery for those as well. Like you were getting ready to say about time. Somebody said to me early on, I looked across at this guy and he kind of had a, a dopey look on his face, but he said something that was so profound. He's like, Gary, time takes time. And it does. And I don't yeah. know if the people who I've damaged are, are rehabbing physically, spiritually, psychologically at the same rate I am. They're not supposed to. That's not going to be realistic. Did you have times, whether it was with Billy or family members or friends, where you went, God, I'm getting better. It seems like they're not getting better as fast as I am. I, I, I don't know. Um... Like, give me, let me, let me give you a potential example. Yeah. Like the idea of Billy trusting you to be at home. Did he ever, whether it was a okay. year in, three years in, where he went, where you had, your intuition told you that there was a shred of doubt in his mind. Like, is she right? Is she good? Did you ever have moments like that? Absolutely. With Billy? Yeah. Yes. Um, he, you know, I did the sober link, but yep. there were times when, with the sober link, I, if you use perfume, it will, it'll say it'll hypersensitive device. Yes. And so there, the, and those times happen, you know, we were always going out to like a golf dinner or a event or something. And I was getting ready and had to do the sober link before, and it would come back that, you know, negative, it would flash or whatever. And I could see the doubt in his eyes. And then, you know, it's sheer panic for me. Like, no, 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 it's not, let me do it again. I have to wait like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, but uh, it'll come back. I promise it'll come back. And, you know, and he's, he's irritated, you know, just one, it's, it's doubt. But I think too, he probably knew it wasn't, but the fact that we were doing this like that, okay, now we're held up. 
Um, and there's still times when, I, you know, they'll be rubbing alcohol or something in my travel pack. And I'm like, no, and it's, it's just rubbing alcohol and it'll spill. And I'm explaining to Billy, like, it was just rubbing alcohol, I swear. And he's like, I know, I know, I know. Like, now we're good. But there were, I think I was on Soberlink for two years after. <laughs> um, and I, I wanted to stop and Billy wasn't comfortable yet. Yeah. So it took. It definitely took Billy, rightfully so, longer than it took me because I knew I wasn't doing anything. But, you know, as during during my recovery, I had to admit all of the things that I was doing. And most of those things, he had no idea. So that was a huge betrayal for him of all the, the alcohol I had hidden um, and how much I was actually drinking and when I was drinking and um how much i had actually lied to him so that took a, a long time the um y y the, the sober link device which which i've used as well and and have for and did for a very very long time i had an episode i was on a trip with some buddies and literally and again this is a this is a device that you blow into it and the results immediately go back to to likely in your case it was billy for me it was my wife and, and she's getting the result immediately on her phone. And I had just used some mouthwash that had alcohol in it. And, and like the, the smallest perceptible amount was, was in my system. And, and I was, I broke out in a sweat. And, and again, it's, you're, you're taking people back potentially to the darkest places. Even though I had done nothing wrong, I don't know what it's like to be that person who finds a bottle underneath the sink or is thinking, oh, my God, like they can't stop. Um, and that's where I have to remind myself that that the damage done, there's layers to this that may take a lifetime to to or may never be fully repaired. So I say that. And your husband, look, his job takes him away from home a lot. And, and it's not only, you know, his sense of peace, knowing you're fine, but also yourself. Like, believe me, being alone was the greatest thing ever oh, because yeah. I wasn't being <laughs> watched. Um, did it take a little while for you to be comfortable being at home and not having the watchful eye of somebody who cares more about you than anybody in the world, not right there. Yeah. Um, when Billy started traveling again, his parents were around a lot. I had him, them come over. My mom was around. I mean, I was not alone very much, which was by, um, you know, my choice as well. Sure. It wasn't, um, it wasn't put on by, by Billy or anything, but, um, it was scary. It was, scary to be alone and you have to learn how to you know be alone with your thoughts your own thoughts again um that's one of the things about when you're drinking that's what you're that's what you're getting rid of you're getting rid of your own thoughts you're hiding everything you're pushing everything down um and so then coming out of that and living sober you're it's you and your thoughts and so yeah when billy left i as very, very thankful I had family around who understood and who would come and support me. And I had my friends as well who were very supportive um, and would come check on me. But I, yeah, that was a that was a transition in itself. It, the um, you know, the, the time right after, you know, early sobriety um, and, and whether it's seven years like yourself or, or 37 years like I, I remember meeting, you know, men and women who, you know, had 30, 40 years. And I'm like, you're, you're like, you're a mythical figure to me. That doesn't seem <laughs> you're like you're, you're not, you're a unicorn. That's not, it can't be real, but it is, it is very real. But, but for people who think they might have help or people who might be in early sobriety and those days feel long. I remember, mm -hmm. I remember like thinking, oh my God, it's only 11 o'clock in the morning because yeah. I made the days shorter because I made the days as short as I could because as soon as I could start drinking, I did. And so early sobriety for a lot of people, did days feel long for you? Did, did it feel like a lifetime until you could go to sleep at night? 
Yeah, they felt it felt very, very long. Um, we had just when I went to treatment, we were in the process of moving into a new house. And so when I was down there, Billy and his family moved everything. And so I was coming home to a new house, which in sobriety, that's a good thing in itself because you're not in your old environment. So that was a plus. Yep. But I also had all of the boxes and one of my one of my things I work on is I'm a perfectionist and I feel like I have to do everything myself, um, which gets me in trouble of being overwhelmed, stressed out. Um, and so one of the things I had to work on and what my therapist told me at the time was one box a day is still progress. And I take that into my life now doing, you know, if I have a list of things, um, doing one thing is still progress. Doing one little step is still progress. Um, and so then coming back out, me walking into a house full of boxes would be an a immediate trigger of, okay, let's get the wine out. Let's get the vodka out. Let's just drink my way through this and enjoy it. Turn Absolutely. some music on or a TV show. Um, and so that was, that was a big adjust adjustment. And this is another common one is cooking. I always had a glass of wine when I was cooking. Um, and so that that one took me a while to not have that taste of wine every time I was cooking over my stove. Um, and now I put my little sparkling water in a wine glass and I just, do, do, you know, walk around and <laughs> have my my pretty my pretty wine glasses. Um, but the one one box at a day, one box a day uh is you know it's like one day at a time another another thing the you know Brittany, for people who you know and and again you never know who's watching listening and like yourself have had people and it's very humbling to have people come up and and say listen i heard that conversation and it was the impetus for me to to get help you, the, the the association, everything, my life had been reduced to everything being associated with alcohol, good day, bad day, anniversary, birthday, uh, vacation, vacation's over, vacation is coming up. Um, I, 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 you know, going, going, going to play golf, going to the gym, everything, I rationalized the, the, the use of alcohol for everything in my life. So to remove that altogether seemed overwhelming to me and I remember the first thing I thought and I again I'm not embarrassed to say this it's just it goes to show you how riddled and paralyzed I was by the disease I thought to myself how am I going to do this like I won't even be able to toast my daughter at her wedding my my daughters were were little young teenagers at the time and it's like really that's the way I thought that's the way I thought and the fact is, is like, really? It's not just your drinking, it is your thinking. It's the way this is, I, and again, I just wanted to stop drinking, but I realized that the examination is about your thinking. And my thinking yeah. had been reduced to one, a one-way road, and it was the Autobahn of thought consumed by all things alcohol and all things drinking. And it, it is, like you said, it's a methodical process. It's, it's progress, not perfection. It is these things that are, as <laughs> you smile, because these are things that you and I can relate to. It's just, hey, you and I wake up every morning with untreated alcoholism, and it's our choice as to whether we're going to treat it or not. It's just today. That's it. Yeah. Um, I mean... Honestly, right now, society doesn't help us either with no. everything that it's romanticized, glamorized, alcohol. glorified yes. everything. And I and I look at these commercials and I go, that's not the way it was for me. Like and I and, I, and again, this is this is this gets to the mind of the alcoholic. And I don't know if you would relate to this. Somebody said to me, I don't know, six months in said that that, you know what, your mind will get get well, it will get clearer your heart will get fuller but there are going to be moments that you're going to think that you can drink like a civilized person again and that's the disease just trying to wait you out you've had those thoughts yeah. have you not 
Oh yeah. I mean, I, I know I can't, I plan on. Absolutely. Never. I mean, it's not an option for me. I'm no. good. That's it's, you know, but I do, you, you see, you, you see it, you hear about it. You, you hear about that guy, you know, from his friend, like, like they come up to me, like they're helping me. Like I have a friend who they were sober for X amount of years and they started drinking wine again and they're fine. You'll be fine. And I'm like, no, 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 I won't. <laughs> Thank you. But that's not true. No, I, I, again, my mind got there. Like, you, you know, for you to, uh, probably as they say, a white ship wonder. I was not. And I got, I, my mind got to where I thought to myself, come on, you can, you can drink in a civilized way again. No, I couldn't. It was awful. It was not like yeah. recalibrating to where it was formally. It was just picking up where I left off. It was as ugly. It was as demonstrative. It was as maniacal. Um, it was as dangerous, if not more so, than it had been the last time. And I, I had heard some of those stories like, really? Like, you've been sober for 18 years, and the next thing you know, you had one drink and you woke up in Bora Bora three days later, and I'm thinking, come on, <laughs> Your money's gone. come on, that, that's <laughs> not true. Yeah, it is true. It yeah. is. And I, I, I need those constant reminders, yeah. Uh, my brother, gosh, I think he's 10 years sober. He, he got sober through AA. Yeah. Um, the, and he, he tried it all. Like he tried just beer, just wine, <laughs> just going to drink on the weekends. I'm just going to drink at night. Like, and so like, he, he's that story of he tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed until finally he realized, I can't drink at all, not an option. And you know, now he's 10 years sober, but good for him. Uh, yeah. 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 And I, 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 again, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, come on, what could that possibly do? I'll tell you what it can do. It can be the ugliest movie uh, that you've ever seen. And, and, you know, maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't need those examples shared with me. Um, but I do. But the fact is, is that I, I lived it myself and it was it was horrifying um, that I mentioned the blog. It's the sober modern mom. And, and the underline of it is navigating through sobriety, motherhood, marriage and life. One of the things you wrote about at your seven year mark was I'm proud to be a recovering addict, a recovering alcoholic, a recovering person. And people can go. God, really? Explain why. Explain why you're proud. Um, gosh, well, one, it's it's who I it's who I am. It's yep. in me. Um, I didn't choose it. I didn't, you know, manifest this. It's not it, it's not the um pretty label that one would want, but it's one that I choose to label myself as because of the work that I have put in to get to where I am today, but also because it doesn't need to be ugly. It doesn't need to be shameful. It doesn't need to be hidden. Um, I, I think that being an alcoholic can be a beautiful thing. You, It does not, I don't look at myself, like you said, you're not ashamed. It, it's, I am, I'm proud to be an alcoholic. I am proud of who I am today. I work my butt off every single day to be the person that I am, to be the wife and mother and friend. Um, and I, I would not, I wouldn't change it for the world. I would never ever be where I am today without being an alcoholic, without being going through those experiences um, and learning. Do I feel do I feel like everybody needs to go through what I went through to be here or to hit rock bottom or no, no. And that's another reason why um, I'm sharing my story so much, because I feel like if you can nip it in the butt, you know, when you feel like you might have a problematic relationship with alcohol, like you just don't like how you feel the next day. You don't, maybe you had a couple bad experiences, you know, you don't have to be an alcoholic to stop drinking. It can help with your depression. It can help with your anxiety. Like alcohol doesn't help any of us positively no. in, in any way. 
Um, and there are people who can just just really do enjoy wine and are wine connoisseurs. And great. Most of us are not that way. <laughs> no, most of us no. are drinking to, because you had a hard day um, because you want to feel better. And that, those are not those are not reasons to drink. You should really be drinking because it pairs well with your food. <laughs> You um you said several things in there that I just want to expound on. You said it wasn't a choice, and it's not. And I'm not I'm not going to spend my life trying to convince people um, that this is a primary disease, which it is. Um, I, I don't need it for myself. I don't need to feel better about myself by people, you know, acknowledging that. Just uh, what I would recommend to people is have compassion for others, because I promise you there is not likely one degree of separation between everybody out there and somebody who is suffering uh, to, to some degree. So it, it isn't a choice. It is, it is there, there are so many things that go into, you know, how somebody, you know, either becomes an alcoholic or how it manifests itself. Just be compassionate. Um, I, would, I would just recommend that uh, to, to everybody. Um, and the other thing, that you talked about is, is, you know, the idea of being proud of it. Look, I, you said it, you wrote it. You didn't dream of being an alcoholic, nor did I, I dreamed of playing second base for the Yankees, but, but I too am, I am, I'm grateful. I'm blessed. Um, I am also proud that I'm a recovering alcoholic because God, if I wasn't, I'd be likely dead. Um, right. and if I wasn't Absolutely. dead, I'd be on the road to, to, to my own death. Um, it is dark, it is corrosive, it is so sad, and it's not just you and me, it's the ones who care for you the most that are so in such pain, seeing something that has overcome someone else, and they don't have a choice, they can't stop without help, and by the way, you and I know this, we can't do it alone, like I, I, I was living this lonely existence of where I had warded myself off from everybody. And, and now, like this, this us, we, and our, that like, I didn't, there was nothing plural in my life. I had kids, I had a wife, I had a great loving family, but they weren't a part of my family. Now, with, with Billy, with your children, with your extended family, like to share all this, to share sobriety, with these other people, it's got to be one of the great rewards you've had in your life, if not the greatest. Absolutely. Yeah. I, that I, you know, I call it a tribe too. You know, uh, we are in itself a tribe that, you know, we have all our, our own isms and, you know, our own yes. tradition we have, and nobody else can really understand us except us. And I think that is, like you said, you were alone, like you, we're alone and so then all alone. of a sudden you open up and you, there's a whole new family, even with your own family too, but it's a whole new thing of being part of this community and this tribe. Um, and I, I loved that. I absolutely, when I discovered that, that was something that I grasped and held on to. And it just, it makes me smile. Yeah. There, there's no doubt. I, I, and again, it's, it's, it's so interesting. You never know what everybody's journey is different. Like the idea of getting together with a bunch of men on a Saturday morning, like I do, and I look around at this room and I go, my God, you, you guys are insane now in sobriety. Like I can't yeah. imagine, but, but the, my point is like, yeah. here are a hundred guys getting together on a Saturday morning and, and they're being vulnerable with each other and they're sharing and they're supporting um, and, and they're being introspective and, and you're thinking, like, how did these guys come into my life? But they have. And they're saving me. They're, they're, they're you know, by sharing, I, I, again, I gain strength by, by the thoughts by somebody who, again, five years ago, how would this guy have ever been in my life? And now, and now he is. And he knows me better than people have known me for 40 yeah. years. They just do because Absolutely. we think the same. Yes. It's amazing. Yep. And uh, I do have to say, we are some of the coolest people, the coolest, <laughs> funniest people you will find. <laughs> yes. And I, and, and before I, I get to these, 
get, add a little levity to this whole thing here at the end is, you know, I, you know, you, you've written about it. And I, again, I'm just going to recommend just going to the sober modern mom. And if you, if you're, you're, you know, in recovery and you want to read some things that you'll identify with, like how dark things get. And then when light starts to shine in again, and they're like, I believe like hope and faith, they run neck and neck. Like I, I felt hopeless. I didn't have any faith. How could I have faith if I don't have any hope? And then it starts to return and little things start to penetrate you again. Like seeing something, whether it's, I don't know, whether it could be wildlife or, or your kid making a face that you hadn't seen him make before, or because you've been so absent mentally and emotionally that you were just numb and you weren't paying attention to those things. When those things start to happen again, Brittany, it is powerful shit. I mean, it just, it, it's, it really yeah. hits you, doesn't it? I remember going to my first concert sober. I'm like, oh, this is gonna <laughs> suck. Like, <laughs> it was awesome. I was like, this is the best experience. I was there, I was in it. But yeah, I mean, I thought going to like football games and all of that was done. Like, this is good. Yeah, like I realize, can't enjoy a football game without 12 yeah. beers. It's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be terrible. Uh, but then you realize you look around and like not everybody's drinking. You just assumed that because you were drinking and it was your whole life. And um, but yeah, not not everybody drinks at football games and concerts and birthday parties. It's yes, it's sho it was shocking to me. It or really going was. to the DMV or jury duty like oh, yes. I did. Like yeah. I would I, like get recess from jury duty and run out and have three drinks. I mean, again, I, I that's everybody what... pre games, everything. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> let me, uh, let me wrap it up with these five frivolous questions, which, right. uh, so here's, here's the first question. The number one show that you and Billy watch together, some just garbage television show that is just, and you share it. What is it? Uh, I would say, Below deck. Oh my. Is that bad or is that yeah. No, it's great. It's great and it's just it's it's so mindless that it, no, I, I I know one of my daughters watches that. Um I, I always think about the people who sign on, like sign off on the like the not the show is built around the people who work on these on these yachts, but like the guests. Like really terrible. It's the most entertaining, and most of them probably need help too. <laughs> they do. I mean, like really, yeah. th this maybe once in a lifetime trip. I'm gonna have cameras and like my behavior, and that's what I think about. Like, why would you sign up for that? But they yeah. do. Uh, thank you for my entertainment. I appreciate it. <laughs> yes. All right. The the best player. You know, for those folks who don't know, you were a college golfer at the University of Florida, and then you started having chronic injury issues. Who is the best player you played against in college? Man. I don't know. I played, so I played with Morgan and um, Morgan Pressel and Paula Creamer. Okay, well, they, they turned pro when they were like 11 years old, so they didn't play yeah. college. But you played they against them. But I played against them in junior golf, and that's who I think about. But um, yeah, like Morgan was playing junior golf and then finishing like in the top five in majors. Yeah, and how was so, like, that? What was to, that like? Yeah, like when I went to states, she was there. I had no chance. I was like, okay, yeah, Morgan wins. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, um, the tour wife who should be featured on the Netflix show Full Swing. Who, who, give me a friend of yours who has got the energy that should be part of Full Swing. I mean, if she's not Lacey Homa, she's hilarious. Okay. Well, that makes sense. She might already be on it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think she was. I, I don't no. think she was part of the first season. That house must be very entertaining. Yeah. There's a reason why those two are together. Okay. For sure. All right, the, the Horschel family guilty pleasure, something that the youngest loves food-wise, that all of you, and like, I, does Billy ever like indulge? He, he, he's a he's very fit guy, and I know he works out like crazy. Okay, so give me, give me something the whole family likes, whether it's Skittles or... 
Um, ice cream. Ice, ice cream. cream. Ice cream. Billy's. Yeah. Billy's vanilla ice cream with chocolate syrup. Um, and Oreos. Okay. I'm not, I'm not allowed to buy Oreos right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then finally, the place that you think, not not as a couple, but you, and maybe he's the same way, because he's, he, I give him credit, he plays around the world. I know he thoroughly enjoys doing it, but give me a place you think you could live in outside of the United States. London. Really? Yep. Do you if I could convince my oldest daughter, we would probably move there. Wow. Now. No chance she's leaving her cheer life here. All right. Well, listen, um, I thank you. And I said this and I meant it when I saw you in the lobby of the Westin Hotel in Jersey City. Um, it was the first time I saw you after I got sober. And I said, yep. you're an inspiration. I and, and I mean it. Um, thank you for, for, for sharing your story, not only now, but periodically, because uh, I think it's really important. Um, and, and happy anniversary next week. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. Thank you again to Brittany Horschel for taking the time. I, I will tell you that, you know, there are certain people, and I actually, I saw Hank Azaria um, just the other day, and this was after Matthew Perry's death, um, talking about his own sobriety. I had no idea that he'd been sober for 17 years, and whether that has any effect on on anybody else i don't know but i think it will and i i do think it's important not only for people who don't have a, prank, a drinking problem and thank god you don't but the likelihood is that somebody close to you may and these things are important and i i say that because i've been lucky enough to hear other people whether it be publicly or privately who've helped me truly and i hope i hope that uh, anything that Brittany said might have been of help to anybody out there. So I thank her, but most importantly, thank you for indulging me to talk about what I think is a really important subject, not only for me personally, but for a lot of people, tons of people out there. So appreciate all of you out there on YouTube, on all of our platforms, and we will see you next week right here on a Five Clubs Conversation. Mm -hmm.